So we moved from communal intentionality with Sharon to communal embodiment with Joel to Scarlett Heinbuch, who will talk to us about a lifetime living between worlds. Love or affectivity is the key. Wow. <laughs> Love is the key, and that is really the cornerstone of my talk today. It is a story about love. It's a story about experience. You're not getting an academic talk from me today. Um, and that doesn't mean I can't. That's one world I've walked in. Joel, shout out to you. My book, and shameless plug, hot off the press this week, and it's a story about love. It's a story about recovery, and it's a story about healing. Because that's why we're here today, right? That's one of the things I've found when in my journey to the impossible, um, I'm gonna to talk to you really about love today. I'm gonna to talk to you about um, things that happened in the paranormal realm, things that happened with other beings, all kinds of things that happened in my world that I didn't have words or, or ways to understand. But I spent a whole lifetime, and that's why I'm here today, to tell you what it's like to be an experiencer at a very young age and be here at this age and trying to reconcile these worlds that I've walked through for so long and still see when I look around that people are in such need of healing, they're in such need of love and such need of reminders that there is love in a universe where they often feel cut apart and cut off. So I wanna talk about that. Um, I wanna also thank Jeff for inviting me here to speak. This is such an exciting moment and time and it's wonderful that I'm bringing up the end of the flash talks. So I hope to leave you on a high note of hope. But when we talk about the impossible, I wanna say that my journey began when I was four years old and I drowned in a swimming pool in our neighborhood um, apartment complex. And I didn't know at that point anything about anything because at four years old, you don't know anything about anything, right? All I know is this. It was 1964, long before we even had the term NDE. Nobody understood that. Um, all I know is that there was a body lying on the bottom of a swimming pool with a little pink rubber cap on, and I was at the floating on the edge of the upside of that pool, looking down on that body that was mine. So I was out of my body, obviously conscious that that other body on the bottom of the pool was also mine. Now, you don't have a framework to talk about consciousness, but I knew that there was somebody there looking at that somebody. When my mother fished me out of the pool, I was blue and I wasn't breathing. My heart had not yet stopped. I was about, she said, just a few seconds away from that happening. So I, wasn't com I had not completed death at that point, but I was definitely out of my body. The thing that I remember the most of being out of my body is that sense of love. Words do not begin to describe that love. We think about love in romantic terms or friendship terms, platonic, agape. This is an everything type of love. There aren't any words in our human vocabulary to really describe what that means. But I felt it, and I felt a sense of safety and security and peace that I had never known in my life because I grew up in an alcoholic home, no fun. And anybody who's grown up in that way, that's a code that you know what that means. So to feel that sense of love and safety and peace, I didn't want to come back. But I also could feel my mother's feelings in that moment because she was a nurse, um, so she knew how to revive me. But I also knew that she uh, was feeling panic and fear and grief and guilt because I'd fallen under her watch, even though there was a lifeguard. And I knew I had a choice to make. And I could have chosen to stay. I could have chosen for things not to revive. But I chose love. I chose love for my mother. I chose love for her, this life. And I, in my spiritual understanding, which was way beyond four years old in that hovering state, knew that this was not going to be an easy path. And I will stand here and say that it has not been. But it's been a rewarding path, and that's part of it too. So I didn't understand what had happened at four years old when I'm hovering out of my body, and I didn't really 
reconcile the experience when I'm spitting up water on the side of the pool and I made the choice to come back. Um, I also didn't understand that by being out of my body that a portal had opened to another realm and it stayed open. And I did not have the tools or the knowledge to know how to close it. So things started happening that I didn't have a framework for. Things like seeing people who had passed on. Things like being out of my body and having my family see my astral body in a physical form. That happened. And uh, these things continued to happen. Knowing things that there was no way that a child of the age that I was could possibly know, but I knew. I knew sometimes when people would die to the day and the minute. It's not comfortable things. I knew um, when relationships were at risk, I just knew things. And I couldn't explain how I knew it. And being that young again, I thought this was normal. Because again, when you're that young, there's no before or after. You just accept your experiences as they come. So I thought other people experienced life this way too. And so when I was about 10 years old and called a witch, I, had, I was horrified. I'd gone to Baptist churches I, um, and would begin to feel this sense of shame and, and like I had to hide, um, that I couldn't talk to people, that there was something wrong with me. So I began to really shut down. And um, I was a very shy child anyway, and I was trying to understand how I was going to function in this world. You know, and, and that was one of the things about this conference. I know a lot of people come to these events to try to find out for sure if there's evidence of an afterlife, if, if these things really are real. Well, I had no doubt about that at four years old. What I struggled with was how I was going to live in this world. Because where I was coming from, having that experience of love, it's so jarring to be here. It's hard. It's very difficult because people don't operate in love here. They operate um, in fear and they operate with what I often see in, that passes for relationships as a casual cruelty to one another instead of loving care. And so when we see that what's possible, and that is not impossible, although sometimes it seems that way, but it's really possible to love one another. As Joel talked about, um, we're all aware of how tough this world is. It's naive to say that we're not in serious peril uh, in many, many ways. You know, just in, in the human realm of suffering that we have that has increased exponentially with the stress that we deal with every day, the, the systems that we are still in and wrestling with, as uh, Dr. Stephen Finley, is that, have I got his name right? I'm not sure where he is. There you are. Meant, you know, this is the, the legacy of racism, patriarchal systems, all of these isms that still populate and keep us divided and wounded. Uh, these are things that are healing and need of healing. So, you know, I, I stand here and I'm still in shock at how, how far we have to go in terms of just being kind to one another and treating each other with dignity and respect. And that those should not be hard things, and yet they are. So when I think about these things, I want to tell you a little bit more about why I'm also, why I wrote this book. And, um, you know, it's, I'm, it just came out this week. I put my heart and soul in it because I felt like I had to tell the truth about my recovery. I wasn't even going to talk about that today, but Joel, thank you for your courage because it matters. You know, we all turn to things to comfort ourselves to try to survive in this world, and some of those things aren't always good things, so we have to find tools and ways that we can recover. And I was in my recovery journey 18 years ago in 2005 when my next experience of the impossible occurred, and that's when um, I had studied Reiki and some energy healing techniques my mother, as I mentioned, was a nurse. She had trained in therapeutic touch, which was a model that nurses used for energy healing to calm patients who were in a lot of pain. So I'd learned about this. I also was, a, at that time, a single parent with two sons who both had disabilities. Um, so I was, um, I was also a PhD student in grad school, and I was teaching a class, Marriage and Family Relationships, as an adjunct professor. And I got that teaching gig by telling them, well, you know, I can tell the students what not to do because I'd made every mistake you could. Because, you know, being aware doesn't prevent you from making mistakes in human relationships, particularly if you didn't have a very strong foundation to start from. And that was my case. So 
Um, so I was lonely, alone, um, struggling. I barely had enough money to put gas in my car for fumes to even get to school. Um, but I'd been hearing about this man who my friends knew who had taken a course of, of very serious illness to the point that he had ended up in a hospital um, and was dying. And he had been sick for three and a half weeks in an unresponsive coma with his lungs collapsed, uh, the total um, respiratory failure, kidney failure, uh, chest tube, in sepsis, double pneumonia, blood clots, atrial fibrillation, everything that could have gone wrong went wrong, transfusions to keep him alive, all these things. And um, his mother had been called that day after three and a half weeks to come say goodbye because he wasn't going to, to make it through the night. At that point, um, the dialysis had tried to keep him alive, but he just had taken a turn for the worst. And, you know, that was it. So I met her that night, and although I never knew her son, who turns out to be David, and I'll tell you more about that, um, something about her touched my heart because I thought if my son, and she'd flown him from San Francisco to Richmond, Virginia, I thought if my son were lying there dying, I'd kind of want somebody maybe to be there. So I offered to go pray with them. I was on a prayer team at the church I was attending at that time. Um, you know, and, and just the whole situation, I had to trust my intuition that I was supposed to show up, even though my head said, what can I possibly do to help this person, or why? I mean, again, I could barely afford the, the car ride over. But I offered to go if she wanted me to, and she said yes, but the, the question mark that lingered was, would he even be alive the next day, because I'd met her on Thursday night. So he was. So I went to the hospital that very next day, and my mother, being a nurse, told me, even when someone's in an unresponsive coma, even though you might not think they can hear what you have to say, talk to them like they're awake. So that's what I did. And I introduced myself, because we had never met. Um, and I also knew, too, that from my healing work, that people have to give permission for healing. You can't voice it on anybody. You can't push it at anybody. They have to want it. And, they, and it's really not people like me being a healer, it's me being a facilitator of someone else's choice. So that's how I viewed it. But here was this man that um, you know, was so desperately ill and just his body was destroyed from the granulomas that had happened. He had a very rare form, rare form of vasculitis called, at that time called Wegener's granulomatosis. So it destroys, it creates nodules in the, the whole vascular system. And it's, it's usually, it was not survivable years ago. And even in best cases, most people live eight years if they even survive it. So, um, but because he'd been on the ventilator at that point for so long, they also, as I said, sus suspected that the oxygen deprivation caused um, some brain injury. So there were just, just multiple devastations. So, and I had never seen anybody in acute kidney failure. So I did not know that the body swelled up. So again, you know, he had a feeding tube in, the, the, the ventilator tube, the central line, the chest, all these tubes and wires. And the only thing I could hear in the room was just the, the machines. Um, and his spirit didn't even seem to be in his body. And uh, so it was just a, just a sad situation. So when I asked his permission to work with him, I stood there waiting because that's one of the gifts of the after effects is I can kind of sense what people are feeling. So I felt a puff of air in the room and I decided that that was an okay yes to do. Now mind you, someone mentioned he was in a Catholic hospital, a Jewish man in a Catholic hospital um, and I was going to do Reiki with him. So <laughs> you can, uh, the nurse, put her little chair right outside the door and sat there waiting. <laughs> I was, I'm sure she was like terrified about what I was gonna do. So, um, so I began my work with David and I just did some as best I could trying not to jar anything. But I started with taking his hand, he had the pulse oximeter on, the IV line, and I didn't wanna jar anything, but I wanted to establish contact. And when I did, that's when I felt his feelings. I began to feel compassion. My heart began to open for this, this man who was set, dying. And I thought, oh my God, we're in a sacred space. He's hovering 
out of his body and I could sense that and I don't know what he's going to do or why I'm even here um, or what I can even help with but I, I knew that I had to do something so as I felt his feelings I also felt his sense of guilt and shame and I didn't know all of the things that he had struggled with in his life but I began to just be flooded with these sense of feelings um, and I again I just felt an overwhelming sense of compassion so I did the work with him. Um, was I didn't feel much energy from him, and I thought, well, he's probably not going to can't stick around in this very devastated body. And I was getting ready to leave, and I had my hand like this because again he had no grip, and I didn't want to dislodge anything. And I was told him that if he wanted me to, if he decided to stick around, if he realized he had some unfinished business and he wanted to, um, that I would come back. And I would make him that promise that I would see him through, but it was his choice. So I was getting ready to take my hand away, and I couldn't. My hand was fused to his. And I, I, I can't even describe to this day how that felt, but I was shocked. And then I stood there for a moment, I kind of laughed, and I thought, oh, he's reaching back. And I could feel it. So that's what happened. And over a 12-day period, we had two extremely unusual events things that had not happened, but and it took me a long time to figure out how they did. Um, the first one was in about three days later when I went in to work with him, he was still lingering. He had not come out of the coma. He was still desperately ill, but he had not passed on yet. And so I took his hand and I had started with an affirmative prayer technique that I had learned because the power of words are extremely important. And so I was using positive, affirmative words. And the other thing I want to say here, I know this is, we are in a religion program, so I'm going to say this. My prayer was very specific, and that was the highest and best, most sacred and holy. And these were the words I'd never said before, and I don't know why I said them. They just spontaneously came out. I said, in this dimension and any other, under the creative hand of God. So I wanted only the highest and best energies. But I was like, why am I even saying in this dimension and any other? I didn't have a conscious understanding why I said that until I under what happened later. But when I started that prayer, the next thing I know, I was out of my physical body and I went to a place. And I was in that place of love without the words that are capable of describing. And it was like a place of total white light dots like millions and millions of particles of light and it was like being transported into this element of that every kind of love there are just no words to describe it but in that space was the spiritual energy the spirit of this man that i was working with and i had not even been able to see his face but there he was his spirit was standing there now we weren't in a tunnel because he had not yet completed the dying process but he was hovering and he was ready to go. And that's when I also had another experience where I realized my heart completely opened and I was like, I know this man. I know this, this essence of this human being. This is someone I've loved. I've loved forever. And I knew it. And then I just knew that I was always going to love this person even if I never met him in this life. And I didn't know what was going to happen from that point on. And I can't even tell you how long I was out of my body. It could have been seconds. It could have been minutes. I don't know. There's no sense of time in that space. But then I'm back in my body, and I'm standing there at his bedside. He's still unconscious, still unresponsive. And I'm wondering what the heck just happened here. And I'm looking at him with different eyes because this is like my forever love who's half dead on this bed and I'm like what how is this possible what am I supposed to learn from this um, why is this happening and then I felt angry because all of a sudden I'm exposed to this kind of love only to, to see that it's just probably going to be snatched away so uh, that was my first lesson in being selfish in love because love is not selfish so but I had to understand that that too that love wants what's best for that person even if it doesn't include you and even if it doesn't include you in this lifetime. So I had to learn that lesson in a, that moment. Um, then some more things happened. A, a few days later, I was at home in bed, and remember, I could see things happening elsewhere. So we have names for that in the parapsychology field. 
Um, but I was in my room, and he was still at the hospital. And all of a sudden, I felt myself in the hospital in the corner, hovering like I had been at the pool. And what I saw and how I perceived it, the best words I could find were I saw four beings at his bedside, and they were very tall, and they were colored blue. And they looked human to me. I'd never seen anything um, like them. They did not look like anything I'd seen from like pictures of communion. I mean, that was my real exposure at the time of to UFO literature or anything like that. So I didn't know what I was seeing, but they looked like a medical team, just, just very tall, holographic, and blue. And they had very sharp features, um, not bird-like, but just sharp, but they looked human. And what I saw was they were replacing his kidneys. This is what I'm perceiving. And I'm, I'm seeing these kidneys, holographic kidneys, going into his body. And I'm looking up. I'm just looking at this as though I'm, again, you know, the fly on the wall. And all of a sudden, the, the, I call it the lead doctor. I don't know. It's like the doctor healing team looked up and nodded at me as though they could see me there. And I was like, oh, they're, they're seeing me. And then I'm back in my room, wondering if I had fallen asleep and had some sort of bizarre dream, except that the next day I go into the hospital and his kidneys that had been completely destroyed, and there's no, when kidneys are destroyed at that level, they do not regenerate. They might recover a tiny bit of function, but they will never receive, recover with full functioning. His kidneys began to heal and function. And his nephrologist came in, and again, in the Catholic hospital, they started calling him Miracle Boy. And each day, his kidney function kept exponentially increasing till it went up to full 100% recovery. There's no explanation for that. So he continued to make this miraculous recovery on all fronts. He woke up. Now, again, he had been in this coma at this point for over four weeks. We had never met. He didn't know who I was, but he said he knew everything about me. He knew my pain and struggles and suffering. He knew things that I had been through, and he knew he was going to marry me, which no small trick at that point. And, um, and, he, uh, and he said he knew everything about me except my name because we'd never met. So, so that's the love story part. And um, I wanted to tell you that because we were featured on a TV show, The Unexplained. And we, I wanted to show the clip, but we couldn't get the permission in time. And um, the show focused only on the four blue beings. And, and that it was important. And it took us 10 years to even talk about that experience because how do you talk about it. I'm a researcher at heart, and in my real world in the financial services field, that's what I do. I research systems, and I always look at things like that, money systems, and how and where I can find all kinds of information. But when I was reading about UFOs, people might started to talk about what we'd experience as our explanation for how his kidneys had healed. Uh, people said, well, aliens, you know? And I, I was like, no, I don't think so. I don't think these were some planet beings who just kind of leap down from wherever. Uh, I don't know. And um, so I had some conversations around that and realized, well, dimensions, that was the word that I'd used. These were beings from other dimensions. Now, my mind was perceiving them as blue, and we know that blue is a sacred healing color. So maybe that was just the way I was perceiving them. But in any, anyway, David had what is called a documented medical miracle. His medical records have been reviewed by uh, several healing um, uh, medical doctors to verify and validate the severity of the illness, the facts of his case, and uh, to verify that there is no medical explanation for how his kidneys healed um, so, pure, so perfectly. So this was, um, so when the show happened in 2019 and, and they positioned me as this great healer, which I had never said I was. Well, that opened the floodgate of thousands of people all over the world 
reaching out to me for help and healing. I was totally overwhelmed. I was working the, again in the financial services field. At that point, I was managing ACH operations. Uh, that's make sure you get your paycheck. You know, <laughs> that's that's what it was doing. I was managing all kinds of things. I was a, a vice president. I was traveling around, you know, managing teams, just doing all the mainstream things because I'd learned to function in that world too. But I always had to keep the intuitive part of me quiet, even though I still brought mindfulness on the operational floor for stress release for people. I would try to bring in little things that I could, but the thing I brought the most in that mainstream world was a philosophy of treating people with kindness, dignity, and respect, because that was sorely lacking in management everywhere. And um, I was determined that I would learn from the worst bosses I ever had and be the very best boss I could be. And that was by being kind and loving and caring by bringing in those principles. Um, so anyway, when the show happened, I had just left my job. I had decided to write this, the first edition of this book because I, I kept trying to explain to people what had happened and that I just couldn't keep explaining it. So I wrote the book to, to pretty much talk about what had happened over that period of time with the healing because it wasn't just a one-off with just the blue beings. It was a 12-day course of healing that uh, was very intense and very, very powerful. So um, David and I, um, he recovered, obviously. He did make that stunning recovery. We did get married um, just seven months later. Um, I, as I said, I was teaching a marriage and family relationships class. I said he's definitely not the checklist on any one of these things. And uh, he wasn't on you know, my manifestation list of my perfect partner. And yet, here he is, um, my perfect partner. And we, we, you know, we do take it one day at a time. We're very incredibly grateful for this life we've been given. Um, and you know, I also want to say that I did study two forms of Reiki. I have taken hypnotherapy to teach people how to use appropriate words for healing. I believe in the power of prayer. I believe in tension. You can call prayer intention. It's really the same thing. But what most importantly is it's about love because wherever you are, you know, we are all embroiled in these systems in this world of often of which we have no control. And I was very moved when I heard the stories from you all about your experiences uh, in, with abductions, things that happen against your will that take away your sense of control. And what I also was hearing too is the need for love that is so huge because we're, we're working in, in worlds and dimensions of fear, but we need to bring back the love. And, and that's the power of choice. And that's what I'm going to talk about, too, and, and you, you brought that up, too. It, it's about we have a choice how we're going to be in the world. We have a choice to love. We have a choice to be kind. And that's the most empowering thing that we can do. You know, um, not everybody's going to get a healing miracle. Not everybody's going to get what they want in this life. And that's one of the things that we learn as we grow in wisdom and love. We don't often get what we want and not to quote, quote the song that we get what we need, but we, 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 we learn about love and real love from that dimension, again, is not selfish and it's not cruel. It's, it's supportive, it's uplifting and it's nourishing. And if we could remember that we have a choice to bring this in every dimension that we are in, in our jobs, in our families, in our friendships, even standing here today, um, talking about having these abilities that I've experienced my whole life, the one thing I did learn and age has, has been a helper has been to put up those barriers so that I'm not inundated with energy and everybody's energy. Um, I have gone on and worked with other people and had similar results and what I found is that the people I work best with who also have miraculous and these are also documented results are people who are also in that hovering between life and death stage and I tie that back to my own NDE of me hovering um, so when people are hovering that's where our, our spirits tend to connect and it took me a long time to learn that and it also took me more than 50 years to even connect the dots of my own NDE and that hovering experience as being the reason why I was able to even have all of this. I just didn't know. And that sounds kind of strange, but 
at four years old, the brain wiring and the neuroplasticity, as we will, if you will, is not there yet. So as I went on and grew, I just didn't, that connection didn't get neurally pathed. So I had to learn how to, what that meant, and it was very profound when I did. So I, I could go on and on, but that's why I wrote the book. It's, it's just because I want to explain to people what really happened. But I also wanted to explain what is not impossible that love really is possible. And if, if, if you haven't had that experience of being on that other side, what I will say to you now, if you had any idea how much love is out there for each one of you, and no matter what you're dealing with right now, if you had any idea how much you are really, really loved, there is a universal force. You can call it whatever you want, but that force is love and it is so huge. And that was, will be the message I wanna leave you with today, that when you have a choice, choose love. And if you are feeling that, like you're that empty vessel and need love, I'm telling you it is there. And all you have to do, you don't have to use psychedelics, but take that breath and start to believe it. And you might be amazed at what's possible in your life. Thank you. Thank you.